welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whitlaw. Now, I'm delighted today that my guest is one of the hosts of one of Britain's fastest rising media channels. Mike Graham hosts the Independent Republic of Mike Graham on talk radio, and uh, he's with me now. A lot of you obviously will be listeners uh, and viewers of that, so uh, it's great that he's with us. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here, Peter. Thank Thank you very much. Um, And isn't it nice to actually be able to meet somebody and talk to somebody? I mean, of course, we will have to say that we're sitting here quite far apart, but, you know, it's one of the things that's been driving, I think, a lot of people crazy is that, you know, you just don't see anyone anymore. Yes. I go into my office, which is which is where the studios are, over on London Bridge, and, you know, there's a sort of skeleton staff, so you yeah. do see some people. But it's just the kind of sociability of, of, of not seeing anyone really outside of work is, is maddening. I, I, from just simply, just anecdotally, from people I speak to, uh, they seem to be at, at the end of their tether in that mm. respect, I think this so. time round. I think you know? so, because I think also you see more people driving cars, you see more people who I think have to work because they simply need the money. Um, And I think the first lockdown, everyone kind of bought into it just because you thought, well, Mm. I guess this is what we have to do. Mm. But, you know, nearly a year later, um, and there's people suffering terribly um, as a result, economically, you know, mentally. And I mean, I'm hoping that uh, this week we've started to see the government kind of talking about coming out of it, which is at least something. Yeah. Yeah. How has it affected talk radio? Have you seen, because you, you know, talk radio has really grown, hasn't it? It really has. In the last 12 months, it's been remarkable. Do you think that's in any way to do with lockdown? Or? I think partly there's been a, a, an element of that because a lot of people have said to us, um, and they did start saying when they were going back to work last year, oh, I won't be able to listen to you anymore because I've got to go back to work. Um, mm. So I think there was an element of a lot of people being off at the beginning of it mm. and literally just sitting at home listening to the radio because, let's face it, most television now is unwatchable mm. and there's only so many times you can watch all the shows on Netflix. Mm. And so I think, and we sort of made ourselves an appointment to listen, I think, because mm. we were the people telling the story of the ordinary people of the country. You know, yeah. we didn't just carry the politicians and the interviews with them and what they were saying. We actually gave a, a platform mm to people, ordinary people who were suffering, people who ran pubs, people who worked in restaurants, Mm. you know, people who wanted to get their kids back to school, that kind of thing. Exactly, and also those people that you talk about are the ones that have kept the whole show on the road. Yeah. Um, And it's great, you know, we go out and clap the NHS and everything, but, you know, the people who work in Tesco's and people who deliver things, they actually don't get that much gratitude. They really don't. And actually, funnily enough, just today I was saying that I think the whole clapping thing has, has is now clapped out, yeah. if you'll forgive the phrase, because the whole idea of clapping last night for Captain Tom just didn't work. People didn't do it. I mean, there was obviously politicians doing it. There was people in hospitals doing it, but there was sort of organised clapping. Yeah. But most, all, I didn't hear anyone in my street clapping. And when they started right. clapping for the NHS last year, Quite a lot of people were coming out. But I think we've just kind of worn ourselves mm. out with all of that. I mean, you mm. can't just keep clapping people, mm. you know. And I think as, as, a, as an individual, I'm probably not qualified to speak on his behalf, but I don't think Captain Tom would have wanted people doing it. No. You know, no. he wasn't that kind of guy. No. Well, that generation was No. That it's, not that, it's not very British, it seems to me. No, it's no. not what we do, no. you know. There, you had a problem, didn't you, recently with the station when it was sort of briefly taken mm. off. Uh, what actually happened with that? Well, can YouTube you have a system which nobody can quite work out. Mm. Um, you may find yourself falling oh. victim to it, or you no, may have worry. in the past. <laughs> the difficulty with, with the big tech companies is they seem to have these rules which they impose, but yeah. they don't really explain what they are. I mean, I interview Peter Hitchens every week, mm. and Peter Hitchens uh, and I started off disagreeing about the lockdown. Now we mostly agree about almost everything. Mm. Um, but I once posted, we once posted an interview with him where he talks about the Danish mask study. Right, mm. and on Facebook, um, they put a little kind of warning on the uh, on the post mm. in which it said some of the information here may be misleading, mm. which I took gross exception to mm. because I've been a journalist all my career, so has he. Mm. And between us, we've probably got you know fifty to seventy five years of, of journalism. <laughs> Didn't you work together? We actually did at one point on the Express. Mm. Yeah, um, he was Russian correspondent for a while, then he was a U.S. correspondent mm. for a while, then he was a sort of reporter at large. So yes, we did. Um, and I was at quite outraged by this, but I could not find anybody to talk to mm. on Facebook uh, about why they'd done that. And, and I thought to myself, you know, there's some sort of dweeb in California who's, who's working for Nick Clegg who seems to think that they know more about this than we do. Well, they don't. Mm. Um, mm. Similarly with YouTube, 
they have a system where they will suspend your account mm. if you violate their community standards. Now, I looked at their community standards and I couldn't work out what it was that, that Talk Radio had violated and neither could anybody at Talk Radio. Mm. So uh, they basically, I think they'd struck out three different interviews, all of which were conducted by Julie Hartley Brewer. Um, and f and when you get three strikes, you're basically out. And so they suspended the account yeah. without warning. They didn't ring anybody. They didn't they didn't email anyone. They just did it. So we had to go back to them and try to appeal it, which we were successful in. Um, and it's still not that clear mm. what it was that we violated. And that's the, that's frustrating. Yes, I mean we we had that uh, problem with them with Peter Hitchens actually. He did uh, right. an interview with us. And it was going great guns. It was going to be one of our biggest, actually. And then bang, it just disappeared. Yeah. So we appealed, not with the you know help of lawyers or whatever. We just did it ourselves, and uh, it was pretty indefensible. So they put it back up. But the right. thing is, Mike, is that they kill the momentum. Yes. When that happens. Well, one of the things that they're very good at, and one of the things that we found interesting is that once your numbers hit a certain level, they start recommending other videos, mm. and so people start being you know, push towards certain things. I mean, I know from my kids because they're much bigger experts on YouTube than I am. Um, you know, they know how the algorithms work so that, say for example, if you're watching an interview with me and Peter Hitchens, they'll then point somebody to the interview you did with him. Mm -hmm. And then they'll point me, then point people to somewhere else that I've done an interview with somebody else. And so it kind of feeds on itself. It's like a, you know, a self-fulfilling sort of um, profit. Mm -hmm. But once it starts to, to, to shudder and sort of stop yeah. and things start getting taken down, the numbers are not as much as, as much. Uh, we're building them back up again, but for a while they were lower than they were before we were banned. Right. So this is because people ask us about this almost more than anything now. Right. You know, we're all facing. There's this three strikes thing you mentioned, yeah. three interviews, and then bang, they take you. Right. Down. But then it's that's not necessarily the end of the story, is it? That you can appeal against that and come back. You can. You did. So. Well, we did. Yeah, and it was done at I think you know a pretty high level mm. within the company. I wasn't involved in that, but I mean, um, the the two the, the third strike, which was the offending one, was 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 put back yeah. as if there was nothing wrong. So it was never explained what it was that, and I believe it was an interview with Grant Shapps. I mean, it wasn't mm. somebody controversial mm. who you know um, YouTube don't like. Um, but the, I think the two strikes still exist mm. for a period of time. Yeah. So they've kind of got you over a barrel in a way. The thing is, is it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because what you do and talk about is entirely within, obviously, the law in Britain. Yes. But the carrier of something can actually frustrate you and actually sort of block you out. Yes. That's well, one of the arguments that we made to YouTube was that we're regulated by Ofcom. Mm. As a result, we have to abide by the broadcasting rules and regulations that exist in this country, which are about as stringent as any country, I would say. Um, so what, what they were complaining about was something that Ofcom had not objected to, mm. as far as we could tell. Mm. And I think part of that argument was what made us get back in, yeah. because they, they, they couldn't really find a reason why they'd done it. Your show is part, it seems to me, part of a new kind of form for media. I, you are a radio station, but because you're on YouTube, you're a kind of hybrid now, mm. aren't you? You're this sort of hybrid... Well, it's not radio anymore. No, it's, what do you call your... What, 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 well, I just call it TV now, yeah. because it really is. I mean, on, uh, on Prime Minister's Questions this week, we, we tried something slightly different, whereby we had myself and our political correspondent, Charlotte Ivers, in the studio. Projected behind us was the, the, the chamber of the House of Commons, and so we were able to point at it, talk about it as it was mm. as it was going out live. Mm. We were able to listen to it, and so it was very much a visual experience, you know. And our growth in in, in YouTube viewers has been remarkable. I mean, you know, tens of millions of views yes. uh, on a on a weekly basis. You mm. know, it's just and, and from a year ago where we had barely had any. The thing is, is, it's interesting. You so see, you have that and 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 various other channels on YouTube doing very very well. And yet you look at the terrestrial TV, particularly for Christmas, you look at the Christmas ratings. Mm. I mean, we're both, I think, roughly the same yes. age, I think. You look at the same, and you sort of see that it's like, uh, to get in the top 10 now, it's like 3.5 yeah. million. Right. Um, when the EastEnders Christmas special, for want of a better example, would be up in sort of 20s, wouldn't yeah, it? It used to be yeah. like 24, 25 million. Yeah, yeah. And I just think people aren't now watching television they're certainly not watching it in the same way mm. where you used to just get home and put the TV on. Yeah. I mean, people don't do that anymore yeah. because there, generally speaking, isn't anything to watch. And I mean, Christmas TV was particularly ghastly this year. I mean, there's oh, literally terrible. nothing on at all. It's almost like they've given up almost, mm. actually. Yeah. You, 
actually you started out as a thoroughgoing print journalist, yeah. didn't you? I mean, when would this have been, right? In the 1980s? Uh, first or? in the 80s, yeah. I mean, I sort of, I went to university in Bath and my father had been in the business. He was an artist, graphic artist. So I'd kind of got exposed to what newspapers were like right. as a child. And I used to, used to work for the Evening News in London. Um, so I remember going in, you'd go into the Associated Newspapers building um, around the back of Fleet Street and it had this wonderful smell. They printed the paper there. There was big lorries with huge, you know, big wallages of paper on them. And they didn't seem to work very hard. I thought, this is great, you know. I mean, they sort of worked on editions, because in those days, the Evening News had seven different editions in, mm. in one morning mm. that they would rush out, and, and they were quicker to react to news. They were much easier, you know, they, they were much more agile, flexible, um, and it seemed like a great fun business. So I kind of decided, when I was at college, really, um, university, that that's what I wanted to do. So I kind of just tried to get my way in, and I managed to do it finally. Um, How did you do that? Just by sheer chutzpah, really. I mean, I didn't actually go to journalism school. I never trained to be a journalist. I never learned shorthand because um, I just didn't want to. Mm -hmm. um, and I was terrified when I was a young reporter that I'd get found out that I didn't know shorthand and I'd be fired. You know, somebody would come out and hand me a load of notes from a court case and I'd be like, oh, <laughs> I can't do that. Um, and I actually rang um, a guy who... I knew who I'd met through my father, who was working as a sub editor or something at the Mail on Sunday. And I said, you know, can I come in and do some shifts? Um, and so I started doing that when I was about 22, 23. Um, and in those days, you could do it. Mm. And believe it or not, the shift was from five o'clock on a, on a Friday night to nine o'clock, which they paid something like 45 quid for, which in those days was quite a lot of money. <laughs> um, and then I found myself working for a magazine as well on the side. And then one day I rang up Kelvin McKenzie. I can't imagine what gave me the, the, the inclination to do that, but I just rang him up one day at eight o'clock thinking his secretary won't be in yet, got him on the phone. And I said, I fancy coming to do some shifts for you. And he went, okay then, um, because I would got hold of him. And he said, how did you get my number? I said, I'm not telling you. Um, and so I came in to see Tom Petrie, who was then the, the news editor, and, um, and just started doing shifts in Fleet Street. And that was kind of how it started. Yeah. And funnily enough, that was where I first met Nick Ferrari who um, walked in, there was this, the old Sun newsroom was very kind of like the Wild West, there was these double doors, and it had it all over the top, you were now entering Sun country. And Nick Ferrari came in, wearing a very disheveled sort of, but a very expensive suit, a crocodile skin um, attache case, and he had a black eye. And um, he sat down next to me, because that was where he sat, and somebody said, what happened to you? And he'd just got off a plane from Sydney, where he'd been trailing around after Elton John, and apparently he'd asked John Reed, Elton John's manager, if he was having an affair with Elton, which he was. <laughs> yeah. But he got punched for his question. And I just thought, this is what I want to do. This is for me, yeah. you know. And then from then, I kind of just worked my way through for a while. Ended up going to America for all sorts of different reasons. Um, and worked in America for, for about 10 years because I, I could see in London there was no... It was still very much monopolised by the unions. Yeah. You know, the first time I got a chance to get a story actually in the paper, the paper didn't come out because the printers went on strike that night. What was your first story? First story was actually uh, that they published of mine was actually in the Sun of, um, and it was about a, um, a touring theatre company that were doing The Curse of Tutankhamun and all the things that they, everything went wrong. <laughs> because it was the curse of two, you know, one of them fell off the stage and broke his leg, set fell down on somebody else. And it was one of those kind of typical yeah. 80s sun yeah, stories, yeah. you know, um, and there was probably a mummy in the headline or something like yeah. that, you know. Uh, and that, you know, that, that, yeah. was, that was it. And it was, I mean, I tell my kids now about how when I was a reporter, you had to actually go to people's houses and knock on the door or you'd have to find them in the local library, you have to go through the phone books to see where they were. And they'd kind of look at me like, you know, because before Google, they just didn't, they said, well, I remember being fly, I remember flying to Kansas City to find somebody. And I had no idea where they were, so I just drove to the local, rented a car, drove to the local library, went through all the phone books, found about six names which looked like theirs, went to all the addresses, eventually found them, got the story. Um, and it was a different world. It's just remarkable. Do you, do you think, I mean, therefore, it does seem that it's a cushy number now, maybe. I mean, in the sense that you, or rather, has the whole nature of it changed because of journalism itself has changed? Well, I think a lot of it has changed as a result of technology. 
um, you know, it's much easier now to find information mm. out without mm. having to go anywhere. Mm. And I think one of the problems for a lot of journalism now is that people, they don't, journalists don't go out anymore. Mm. And, you know, when I was doing it, we met people all the time. And so you'd meet people who would give you stories. You know, you'd go and cover the local council, mm. get friendly with the local councillors, take them for a pint. There's always a story, you know, whereas I remember when I was working for Piers Morgan at the Mirror, he used to come in in the morning. If he saw loads of reporters sitting there, he'd be like, what are they all doing? Get yeah. them all out on the street, get send them out yeah. and don't yeah. tell them to come back till they've got a, a story. But the thing is with that, though, is it does sound... OK, you know, you'll always look back with rose-tinted glasses, but it does sound kind of quite fun and exciting. It was. And I think now the friends that I've still got left working in, in newspapers are not having a very good time. You know, they haven't got the same kind of money. They certainly haven't got the same kind of influence that they used to have. I mean, it was very much the Wild West when I worked in newspapers. And, and if you were a journalist, people, when you put the fear of God into them, mm. if you rang up a, a government minister from the sun, now I don't think they care so much, you know, because they're controlling it a lot more and they're much more likely to ring your boss and say, oh, some, some you know, whippersnapper from your paper has been uh, harassing me. Mm. I don't like it. Mm. And certainly showbiz wise, if you ring up any sort of um, agent with a, with a sort of scandal story about their star, first thing they'll do is get lawyers to ring you. Yeah. and say, how did you get this information? Have you been hacking my phone? Did you actually, you know, dig around in my bin? Mm. And they'll just close it down. Because, you see, when you were uh, a reporter, uh, you weren't even talking about phones, really, were you? I mean, you didn't have mobile... No, my, I got my first mobile phone when I came back from America to work for the Daily Express in 92, and they handed me this brick, mm. you know, one of those Nokia things with a big aerial coming out the top, <laughs> and I didn't even know how to use it. Yeah. I took it out. I got my first. They, it was as if they were punishing me because I'd been covering stories in Dallas and Chicago and Los Angeles, you know. And they sent me to Snaresbrook Crown Court to cover <laughs> some MP who's been done for speeding. Um, and uh, I came, came eventually. Came, and the, the first thing I did was when I finished the court case, I went to somebody from the Times and said, "So we're we going for lunch?" And they went, "No, no, we're going back to the office." Mm. And this was the nineties, mm. so it was already kind of mm. changing. Because mm. I was like, "Really? Okay." Um, so I went back to the office and the news editor said to me, where the hell have you been? I said, well, you know where I've been. You sent me to Snaresbrook Crown Court. He says, you haven't been answering your phone. And I looked at it and he said, it's not even on. Because <laughs> I, I had no idea. I was like, well, you don't told me to put it on. I had no idea. Yeah. So, you know. Um, yeah, so in America, it was all pay phones everywhere you went. Yeah. Um, and all the newspapers in England had, because I worked sort of freelance around my own uh, business. And I ended up working for all sorts of people like Danish magazines and French magazines and Australian. I made a lot of money. Um, but everywhere you went, you'd make a toll free call yeah. from the street. Yeah. You know. Did you enjoy being in New York? I loved it. New York was a really exciting place in those days because I'd come from a kind of post labour run Britain in the early 80s. You know, Thatcher was in charge, but she hadn't really fixed very much. Mm. And it was still, you know, strikes all over the place and nothing really worked very well. And mm. I don't know if you remember this, but when you moved to a new flat or something like that, to get a phone put in, it used to take about two months. Oh, yes, yes I do. Because I you do could remember. only... Unfortunately, I do remember yeah, that. Yeah, because you could only go to British Telecom <laughs> yeah, or whoever yeah, it was, you know. Yeah. Um, so I moved to New York in 1983 and it was like a playground. Mm. It was open all the time, 24-7, the, bar, the bars never closed. Um, you know, I was very popular with my English accent with all the women. Mm. Um, and it was just a fabulous place to be. It was dangerous. You know, the mafia were there. Um, it was actually, when you were there, it was around about the time, was it not? Uh, it was pre-Giuliani? Well, it was, pre -Giuliani. it was when Giuliani was the um, uh, US attorney for yeah. the Southern District. So it was when he was going after all of the sort of mid 80s. It was when he started going after the mafia mm. and also all the insider traders and so Michael Milken and all that sort of stuff was going on. So it was very dynamic. Um, and I started work for a, for a newspaper there, which was a bit like National Enquirer called The Star, kind of celebrity driven. Um, but they used to, I mean, I've spent weeks and weeks and weeks just on the road. Mm. I'd got sent to meet some people. I, I remember they sent me once there was a space shuttle coming in. So they sent me to meet the space shuttle down in Florida. Mm. And the space shuttle landed and they took them all to Houston. So they said, oh, well, you better go to Houston then. So I went back to the airport and went to Texas. You know, it was like, and it was like that for weeks and weeks on end. And then they'd go, well, you're in Texas, you might as well go to California for this, you know. And so it was fantastic for me. I was 23. So you, know? you, you didn't have a specific beat as such. You were a reporter. You, you went where the story was. Yes, pretty much, yeah. I mean, like I would be sent to cover the, when the earthquake in San Francisco, go and cover that. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and a lot of the early stuff that I did was very tabloidy. It was very mm. sort of, you know, 
I went and doorstepped a guy who was supposedly living with his mother in the biblical sense in Tennessee, which was interesting. Um, it was the first time I'd had a gun pointed at me. Mm, wow. <laughs> and he, was, he, he literally opened the door with a shotgun. Yeah, like in a movie. Yeah, yeah, it was like that. I mean, yeah, I was in my yeah. 20s, I was making loads of money, and I was flying to places I'd only ever heard of in, you know, in the movies. But you see a young person now of 23, all sorts of reasons it would not be like that. I do just mean technologically. I mean, first of all, are the chances for them to get into journalism even there in that way anymore? I'm I mean, not okay, even you... sure they are. I mean, when I was at the Mirror, they had a graduate trainee scheme mm. uh, and they would give three jobs out every year. They used to get 12,000 applications just for three jobs. Mm. And the pay was awful. Mm. It was like 15 grand a year or something, mm. you know. And in fact, um, if you remember the story the Mirror did um, when they got the, the footman into Buckingham Palace. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a graduate trainee who did that. Really? And he got a pay rise to 24 grand. Really? So, you know, I mean, yeah. and that was when, the, when it was better than it is now. Yeah. And I think now what you have is a sort of banks and banks of online journalists, you know, who just basically are, are told, churn it out as quick as you can, do as many stories as you can in a day. And they never go anywhere. They're like battery chickens. And they presumably just simply rely on Twitter a lot. They do. I mean, I, I've, I mean, I'm not complaining about it. Daily Express Online basically does a story a day off my show. Mm. You know, if I say something, it's a story. Mm, mm. And I'm, you know, very happy for the publicity, but it's not really what I would call news, you no, know. No. Can you sort of give us an example? I mean, it's very hard to convey, you did mention it there, quite how powerful the tabloid press was, particularly the Sun, mm. uh, in those times. There was that famous somewhat won it, you know, headline yes. with the 92 election. But have you got any other instance where you can say, well, this shows you how powerful they were? Because, you know, obviously the print, the print media generally is much diminished, mm. isn't it? How it would is. You, how would you illustrate it? Are there any examples? Well, I think, I mean, the whole Gordon Brown experience was interesting, I think, mm. with The Sun, because um, The Sun declared, um, I think it was on the eve of Gordon Brown's speech, uh, Labour Party conference. He was going to make the big sort of set piece speech because he was now going to be running for office for the first time because he'd sort of inherited Downing Street from Tony Blair. And he found out, I can't remember exactly how, um, that the son was going to back Cameron, having backed Labour for, you know, the intervening sort of Blair years because they got so sick of the Tories. And he never forget, and he still to this day has never forgiven the son for that. And he, I think he, he, because of that, Tom Watson, went on this kind of crusade, because yeah. Tom Watson was more or less one of his henchmen, yeah. went on this anti-Murdoch you know, Murdoch crusade, mm. um, which, which ended with all sorts of allegations being made, ended with a newspaper closing down. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying the whole thing was related, but it was, it was, an, it was a, a move that I don't think Cameron would have won the election had he not had the backing of the sun. I think if Gordon Brown had been backed, mm. he probably would have won. And so I think, and I appreciate that's probably quite a long time ago. Um, but just on a personal level of, 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 you know, making people stand up and pay attention, mm. you know, you couldn't ignore newspapers in those days, whereas I think a lot of times now politicians can and do. Yeah. They don't court... I mean, if you look at what Alistair Campbell and the whole Blair project did to yeah. court the Daily Mail, to court Paul Dacre, to get the backing of, of what would be considered to be right-wing newspapers. I mean, I worked for The Express at the time when Lord Hollick bought it. Right. Um, because it was run by a guy called Lord Stevens of Ludgate. Yes. Um, and we were going into conference one morning and we had a new um, editor. Uh, and he said to the news editor, what's the top of the news agenda today? And uh, the news editor said, uh, we've just been sold. And nobody knew. <laughs> <laughs> and the editor was like, really? Okay, who's bought us? Oh, it's Lord Hollick. And what we didn't know was that this was the whole new Labour project. Yeah, so not yeah. only were they persuading Dacre to back them, yeah. but they were persuading um, the Sun to back them. And now they were going to buy the Daily Express effectively and get the Express to back them. Yeah. And it was a very curious moment when um, I was a foreign editor at the time. And the, the editor, Richard Ellis, was sitting on the back bench, which is where the sort of production goes on. And he was on the phone to um, Lord Stevens, who was dictating a leader to him about how they were going to back the Tories, right? Yeah. I pick up the phone, um, and it was Lord Hollick. And he said, can I speak to Richard? I said, well, he's actually on the phone at the moment. I said, what is it? He says, well, I'm going to dictate a leader. And I said, ah, OK. Well, do you want to dictate it to me? I'll take it down. So he dic he's dictating to me a leader about how we're backing the Labour Party. 
Um, meanwhile, the editor's over there <laughs> taking it from the other guy who didn't know that he was being shunted. Yeah. Right? And by the time the evening finished, we published the Labour one. Yeah. And that was the end of Lord Stevens. One thing that sort of strikes me, and I don't know, I've got no data for this at all, but that the journalism then, uh, print journalism, was a sort of classless thing that you could get into. I think we've sort of talked about that a bit. But now it feels quite solidly middle class. Oh, very much so, even yeah. In, even in its politics. Yes. Well, again, I think it goes back to um, this idea of not really meeting the people, you yeah, know, because yeah. you've got far more now people getting into journalism from university, like the graduate training scheme at the Mirror. And we're talking about the Daily Mirror, you know, which was supposed to be the sort of cloth cap um, and whippet brigade, yeah. you know, North of England, Labour Party, stalwart working class newspaper. But they're hiring people who have been to university. Mm. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going to university, but they weren't, they didn't have a sort of apprentice scheme, no, no. which you would have thought, no. because they also owned quite a lot of regional newspapers. If I'd been running the company, I'd have gone, look, we need to be picking kids up out of school, 16, 17, putting them through, you know, journalism school, teaching them shorthand, teaching them the law, teaching them how to be a newspaper reporter, put them in the local councils. But it all stopped. And as a, one of the things that's a problem, I think, for scrutiny, particularly in local councils, is local councils have become ridiculously powerful in the last 20 years because nobody bothers checking what they're doing anymore. Yeah, exactly. There's nobody yeah. actually kind of holding them to account yeah. because there's just one guy sitting in a, a sort of remote office somewhere with a computer and he's not going to the council mm. meetings he's not getting to know them he's not mm. finding out where they're squirreling away all the money i mean steve can't get away with murder in london because nobody goes to see what he's doing you know um mike just to go back a bit there you you know you were talking about being in america um what do you make of it now do you because obviously you talked about a time a very particular time it was here it was the thatcherite years there then it was the reaganite years mm. There's been a vast change, hasn't there? There really has. I mean, when I went to America in the 80s, it was everything I could have ever wanted it to be. Um, and Britain was everything I didn't want it to be. And that was one of the reasons I left. But when I came back to Britain in the sort of early 90s, um, I noticed that it had improved significantly, um, even in terms of things like the restaurants were better, mm -hmm. you know, the hospitality was better, um, the, the, the sort of attitude was better. You know, because in the early part of the 80s, you still had this kind of dreaded, you know, well, well we don't like rich people much, you know. Um, and I really admired the American sort of admiration, if you like, for people who had done well. You know, I used to make an analogy and say, you know, in America, if you drive a nice car, people look at it and say, this guy must be a success. In Britain, they run a key down the side of it mm. and go, you know, rich swine, what, what are you doing with that? Um, and, but at one point, I'm not exactly sure when, it sort of flipped and I noticed, I started to notice as I, because I've still got family back in America, I started to notice sort of through the early part of this century, I suppose, when I was going back to America, things weren't working very well. You know, the immigration system was really awful at Kennedy Airport. The roads were starting to fall apart. The railway system, which was so good when I was there mm. in the 80s, suddenly the train started to crash and stuff, you know. Mm. Um, and politically, I think it was kind of killed a bit by the, 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 the combination of Bill Clinton mm. and Barack Obama, mm. you know? Mm. Um, obviously, I think 9-11 had a massive effect mm. Mm. as well, and New York City has never been the same. Mm. I mean, you know, I remember going back there first sort of two months after 9-11 had happened, and it just wasn't the same city. Yeah. The attitude had changed. It was very in your face when I lived there in the 80s. It was kind of, you'd have an argument before you got to the end of the street with somebody. Yeah. And now people were just being nice to one another, mm. which I couldn't quite understand. <laughs> it wasn't the New York that I knew and loved, you know. And so, um, and now I just don't recognise it, mm. you know. Um, I don't get where the, the whole kind of extreme left and extreme right came from. I mean, I know that parts of the South of America, the Southern states were always a little bit odd, a little bit different, mm. and a little bit racist. Mm. But they seem to have become so polarised, you know. Where do you stand politically now? Where, where, how would you characterise yourself now? Well, I get characterised by lots of different people who have me as anything from a sort of far-right Nazi fascist yeah. um, to a kind of, you know, Boris Johnson lickspittle. I'm not really either of those things. I think part of the problem with journalism now is that you're required to have mm. some kind of allegiance to mm. a political figure. Mm. I have no allegiance to anyone. Mm. You know, my belief is that Basically, uh, I will pick on any politician that I wish to. Mm. Um, if I don't like what they said, if I don't like what they're doing, if I don't like their policies, I, I'm not tribal. Mm. You know, I actually don't vote. 
no. at all. No. I voted once in my life in 1979, and I actually voted Labour. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, finger on the I was, pole. I was, yeah, exactly. Um, funnily enough, I was in Bath at the time, and there was a guy called Martin Baber, whose name has always stuck with me, who was up against Chris Patton. And that was when Chris Patton got in on the big sort of oh, blue wave. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was the last time I ever voted, um, because I believe that actually journalists shouldn't vote. I don't think you should, if you're going to be critical of anyone, you can't vote for them. But they do feel, it does feel now, that they are one of the same kind of group. I yes. Mean, you know, they're very, very comfortable together. Yes. Well, people talk about the Westminster bubble, and it's true, yeah. because I think what you'll find now with, with people, I mean, when Kelvin McKenzie was around, um, and he's a figure that people love to hate for all sorts of reasons, but he wouldn't be caught dead having dinner with the no. Prime Minister or no. the Health Secretary, whereas now... You know, editors of newspapers quite regularly have cabinet ministers around for dinner. And I think that's a mistake. I think you should always, as a journalist, be on the outside of that. Yeah. You shouldn't be part of it. You know, go for a drink by all means, you know, hang around in the House of Commons. But don't become friends yeah. with politicians because that is inevitably going to colour what you do. When did you and why did you get into radio then? Well, I kept I mean, getting fired from newspapers. Quite a way back before uh, talk radio. Yes, I mean, I kept getting fired from newspapers, basically. Um, <laughs> and uh, when I was in, I got sent to Scotland by Piers Morgan to run the Scottish edition of the Daily Mirror. And um, I found Scotland to be a very interesting place because my parents are both from, from Glasgow. So I've kind of, I kind of get the Scots, which a lot of English people don't. Um, Isn't your name Archibald? Archibald is my first name. Yeah, yeah. the first-born son of the first-born son in the Graham... Yeah heritage it was my father's name his father's name before yeah. him you know all of that but my mother only agreed to it on the basis that i would never use it yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but again i mean my parents my father was protestant my mother was catholic um they had to move to london to get married effectively because back in the 50s when they did that that was considered to be a mixed marriage you know and yeah. it was quite scandalous it was like and i didn't really understand any of that until i got to scotland yeah. because then when i was working there People would be puzzled by my name because Graham is quite a Protestant name, but Michael is a Catholic name. And they have this code in Scotland where they ask you where you went to school, which is how they figure out whether you're a Catholic or a Protestant. I mean, it's very weird. Mm. Anyway, so um, I was waiting for the mirror and I started doing sort of little appearances on the BBC. They would ask me in to do paper reviews and they would wheel me out whenever they wanted some tabloid story explained to them and stuff like that. So I started to get into doing radio um, and I quite liked it. And then finally, the Mirror basically closed the Scottish office down because it was another one of these, you know, cuts. Death of a thousand cuts, which is what newspapers have suffered. They already had the daily record. They figured they didn't need the Mirror as well. Um, and before that happened, I'd been approached by this new talk radio station to do a show on a Sunday for them. And the day that the, the, the news broke, that they were shutting it all down, I got a call from the guy who had hired me for the Sunday to say, how do you fancy doing Monday to Friday? I said, fine, <laughs> I've got nothing else to do. Um, and they paid me quite well to disappear off with redundancy money. And I was hired by Talk 107, which was the first speech radio station, which is interesting actually, first speech radio station since LBC in 1973 was ever launched. And that was, really? and this was now yeah. 2006. Was LBC 1973? And it was. Was it really? Yeah. yeah. Which is why when people say, oh, you're not doing as well as LBC, we go, well, they've been going for quite a long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And they've also got an FM signal, which we don't have, because yeah. FM was supposed to have been done away with yeah. by various governments, but it's still there because the mm. BBC won't allow it to disappear. Mm. You know. Anyway, so, so I said to um, this guy, program director, I said, how do you know I'm going to be any good at this? He said, yeah, you'll be fine. You can talk. And I didn't really know if I would be any good at it because it was a very different sort of radio. It wasn't just going on the BBC and talking to somebody who was yeah. interviewing you. It was actually formulating ideas and being quite bombastic, I suppose. I mean, it was a great training ground for me because, I mean, at the beginning, I don't think anyone was listening. So, Because yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I said on day one when we launched it, I said to this guy, Colin Patterson was his name. Um, I said, how do you know if anyone's listening? He said, you don't. We hope they are, you know. Um, <laughs> and we actually did all right. We got 5% of the market, which right. is all that speech station gets. That's what LBC's got. But it wasn't quite enough to make enough money yep. out of it. And yep. so eventually, even they, they fired me as well. Um, <laughs> it's, good for, it's good for the soul, isn't well, it? Well, do you know, some people <laughs> hate the fact that they've been fired. And, and I've had to fire people in my time. Yeah. And people sometimes take, take it very badly. Uh, I'm not redundant, I was once told by somebody who we made redundant. I said, well, nobody's saying you're physically, personally redundant, but your, your job mm -hmm. is redundant. Mm -hmm. Take the money, 
go and play golf. Mm. You know, you're 65 or whatever. But some people really don't like it. I, I wear it as a badge of honour because I was never fired for being incompetent. I was just fired because the new regime yeah. didn't want me around. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I was famously fired by um, Rosie Boycott for not being a woman, basically, right. because uh, she came to be editor of the Express, yeah. and I was asked by Lord Hollick, funnily enough, because he had everybody from different departments into his palatial office to discuss what the future was, and he said, "Why are you the only?" Um, department that hasn't got any women in senior positions and I said well it's not that I haven't got any women in senior positions but production work which is what I was doing work it tends to be very late at night you finish at one in the morning yeah. a lot of women don't like doing that yeah. I'm sorry if that sounds in some way sexist but I mean it's not for want of trying we've got yeah, plenty of women yeah. who work as sub-editors but they prefer to go home earlier yeah. you yeah. know and so they then replaced me with a woman I see Rosie Boycott was a uh, I should explain she, she was uh, you didn't hear of her she's still I think yeah. she's now living in the country growing cabbages and with a barrister husband. But she was a very unusual uh, editor for The Express, wasn't she? She really was. I mean, she came from Spare Rib, I think, originally. Yeah. <laughs> and she was a feminist. And, you know, she had a very odd idea yeah. about um, newspapers because yeah. we would normally have a conference with about, this was the sort of planning meeting for the day, you would say about maybe 15 people in it. You know, the news editor, the front editor, the picture editor, you know, the night editor, the various executives. She would have conferences with about 30 people yeah. and all these kind of bright young things that she'd hired from places like The Independent, which yeah. is where she'd come from. And, you know, there'd be some sort of spotty little geek standing there saying something like, well, I don't think that's a very good story about something that was on my list of, yeah, you know, yeah, foreigners. Yeah, yeah. And I would say, I don't know if I could swear, can I? Of course you can. I would say, what the fuck do you know? <laughs> and she didn't really like that very much. <laughs> and at one point um, there was a cr an air crash in, in Japan or something. And I said, you know, well, I think this is obviously quite an interesting story for the front page. You might want to, if there's British people on board, you might wish to, you know, move it further forward in the book. She said, no, I don't think I want to do that, but just don't bury it. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? Yeah. What do you mean don't bury it? Do you mean don't put it on a left-hand page? Do you mean don't put it as a single column? What do you fucking mean? Yeah. And she wasn't used to that. No. You know, but, I mean, I didn't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> well, when it's sort of going forward, uh, like with the show, obviously, big, big success, um, you know, where do you think the whole media landscape is going to be in five years' time? I mean, it's, it's a huge question, yes. sorry. But, I mean, generally speaking, do you think, like, say, here we are in 2021, will we have, for example, a BBC by the time 2027 comes up, for example? Well, think? I think they, they, they're going to have to renew their charter, aren't they? I yeah. think by 2027. Yeah. Um, and I can't see them keeping the same format. No. Of of license fee yeah, payment yeah. as they have now, yeah. I think they're under a lot of pressure, yeah. um, and the fact that they are politically sort of um, on their own, as it were, because they've got a conservative yeah. government which is which is now here for the next you know what four years, I really think they're going to have to not just cut back on the amount of money that they spend, but they're also going to have to cut back on some of the things that they do because I just think there's no reason why mm. the BBC should have. Do you know they have ten television channels? Because they have the yeah. basic, um, the basic four, including BBC Three, which eventually been shut down, which apparently seems to still be going. They've got international BBC. They've got the news channel Twenty Four. Mm. They've also got another channel which runs only on airlines, which is all different people. I mean, the thing about the BBC that astonishes me is that you, you switch it on one day, there'll be some guy who's clearly been there a long time reporting from Washington. And you go, well, where does this guy come from? Yeah. How many people have they got there? Yeah, yeah. You know. I saw a guy tweeting out the other day about the Irish situation, which he got completely wrong being a BBC correspondent, of course, because he was blaming Boris, basically, for yeah, yeah. what's going on in Belfast. Mm. And um, he works for some outfit that I'd never heard of, but it's a programme that goes out every day. But I don't know where it goes out, and I don't yeah. know who he is, and I've yeah. never heard of him before, but there's so many of them. Yeah. And they've got a taxi bill that runs into like the 20, 25 million quid a year. They can't keep going like that. There's sort of, I think actually, it, it was yesterday, we we're, were filming this uh, on a Thursday, so yes, it was yesterday, there was this uh, thing that came out where the new director general is Davy, isn't it? He was yeah. saying that uh, a subscription service to the BBC would cost 400 quid. Did you see this? I uh, didn't see that. This is yeah, Tim Davy, right? Who's yes, come in yes. supposedly to, be, to wipe, wipe the place clean and bring yes. a new broom. My favourite example of that not happening is Ken McQuarrie, right. a guy called Ken McQuarrie who was... I think he ran BBC Scotland when I was in, in Scotland. Um, he then became sort of leader of regional output or something like that. Mm. 
for 325000 a year, by the way. He now has been given a new job because he retired from that one, and he's now in charge of news impartiality for oh. <laughs> 325000 a year. So he's got the same job, he's got the same money. I mean, I, I said to somebody the other day, what, what do you do in that? Mm. What, you come in in the morning, mm. read a couple of emails, mm. look at the news, work out it's not very impartial. <laughs> Go to the coffee machine. <laughs> I mean, you know, what does he do <laughs> for that money? I, I, I was wondering, he can't have a very big staff if it's about <laughs> impartiality, that's for sure. Well, exactly. Um, no, but I think uh, that there are obviously going to be uh, big changes there, but more broad, broadly as well. I mean, we've been living through this horrendous year. Mm. Uh, you're talking to people all the time on your show. I mean, what basic changes do you think there will be in, in Britain you know, as a result of this, or will there be none? Well, I think there will be. I mean, it's difficult to know exactly what they will be, but I, I can tell you that an awful lot of people are very disenchanted with what they call mainstream journalism. Yeah. You know, more and more of them are watching shows like the one we're doing now, watching us on... I mean, I've got so many people on a daily basis saying we don't even watch the news anymore. Mm. We just don't. Forget mm. Sky, forget the BBC, forget ITV. We only watch talk radio um, which is not just a plug for talk radio but I think people are interacting more with it mm. and it's taking them to different places I mean it's slightly troubling because there are some people out there who are I think not particularly honest with their with their viewers and their listeners some of the kind of what I would call slight outliers yeah. in the kind of you know the YouTube area yeah. um, who have sometimes got quite a big following and I think there's a danger there, but I think the media's what, what got. What do you mean exactly? What what, what, what what you mean just there are what opportunists or what? Yeah, I think so. I think people that are sort of just making money from people's kind of willingness to believe them, oh, telling people what they think they want to hear. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. the conspiracy types. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think the danger for for those of us who are doing what we're doing on the right of centre is that you know we can often be accused of doing exactly that, which yeah. is not what we do mm. at all, as mm. we were saying earlier. Mm. I mean, we work under fairly strict re rules and regulations from Ofcom. But isn't it also that the, 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 the general, they call it the Overton window, I've never quite understood that, but the general terms of reference have got very narrow. Mm. I mean, you're called hard right now, even if you're a good old fashioned Tory. Yeah. Oh, you totally. Know, you know. Well, I mean, we had a whole debate this week about how useless the Labour Party have become. Mm. And how controversial it now is mm. for Keir Starmer to mm. say that maybe it's a good idea to have a union jack in the background mm. when you're talking. Mm. You know, mm. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as I said to somebody today, I said, don't mind waving the Palestinian flag around. Yeah, it's yeah. just the British one they don't like, you know, yeah. or the European one's fine as well. Yeah. I think that um, the whole media landscape is going to change. I think that um, sort of citizen journalism, which has its good points and its bad points, yeah. will continue to grow. Um, but it will be, I mean, GB News is going to be on the horizon as well, which is going to be interesting. We'll see how that goes. Um, what, do you, what do you think that will be like? I mean, what's your instinct? About my it? sense is it's going to be a lot more like, say, uh, format-wise, like sort of Fox News. Yeah. But I don't think it will be politically like Fox News. I think because yeah. Fox News is quite right-wing yeah, yeah. in a lot of places. Um, but I think their idea is to make it sort of presenter-led. Mm. It's not going to be a news channel mm. like Sky. Mm. It's going to be show-led by individual sort of presenters. Yeah. Um, and I think it's got a big market. I mean, it's kind of where we are. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sort of coming after our market in a way. Yeah. I think they'll find it quite difficult, only because there's not that many great presenters that can do it mm. who are that way inclined, you know? I mean, Andrew Neil's obviously very experienced, very good, but he's, he's one person, you know? Dan Wooten's gone there from uh, Talk Radio. He's all, he, he's very good. That's two people. Yeah. If you're producing a 24-hour news channel, mm. you need a lot more. Yes. You know, exactly. and it's expensive as yeah. well. I mean, obviously, it's to be is to be really uh, welcomed. I, I think. In oh, a way, for sure. I suppose there is this sense, isn't there, that you know things have a tendency to become a little bland if you're not careful. I mean, mm. you know, the, the wonderful thing about you, YouTube is you can actually keep quite focused, yes. can't you? you know? yes. But with this, you sort of think, well, actually, well, we're a bit, somehow it gets diluted if you're not careful. Right. Well, yeah. we've already seen The Guardian attacking them before they've even started, yeah, yeah. saying it's going to be very yeah. you know, right wing and it's going to be this. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody knows exactly what it's going to be. But I mean, for The Guardian, with their sort of stable of columnists who are quite frankly off the scale, mad lefties, mm -hmm. um, I mean, even the parody 
page isn't as funny as the real Guardian. <laughs> you know, when they put out those headlines yeah. that you think they've really done, but they haven't. Actually, the real Guardian's even funnier. Um, you know, for them to accuse somebody yeah. of being biased is laughable. Yeah. It really is. You do something called Plank of the Week, don't yes, you? Yes, we do. And it's back, isn't it? It's just come back? It, no, we never went away. Oh, um, it? it went away partially in the summertime. Uh, last year because we couldn't right. get anybody into the building so we were doing it all on zoom yeah which was never quite as good uh, at the moment we we're in a situation where we still can't get anybody into the building but we can get people who have got a staff pass right into the building who work on regular shows right so we're doing it with Dawn Neeson and Kevin O'Sullivan so no I mean it started last um January so it's just kind of celebrated it's become a real thing hasn't it it I'm, really has yeah. well do you know it's funny it started with with me sitting at home over Christmas 2019 um a bit bored and I thought, I'll come up with a list of the 10 planks of the year. See how that goes, you know, because I do quite like winding people up on Twitter. Um, so I put this list of 10 people out. And people were like, what about this guy? Well, that, you know, so then I did another 10. Before I knew where I was, I'd done 100 people, you know, ranging from Prince Andrew to, you know, Jeremy Corbyn to, you know, all sorts of other people. And then somebody in, in talk said, why don't you do a TV show based on this? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where it came from. And, and I think that's what's also good is that now we can do that. I mean, you can you can shoot a television show now without having to have those massive, great, big professional oh, cameras. Yeah, I mean, I don't yeah. mean these are not professional, but, you know, they're not those huge oh, things you see smaller. in, in TV smaller. studios, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, and I guess this is why citizen journalists are so easily able to access um, the media now, because mm. they just do it on a phone. Who was your plank of the year last year? Did, it you, have was, a, did you have a, a year... I think it was I think it was Sadiq Khan. Oh right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I mean I should remember it. It was between Sadiq Khan and Meghan and Harry basically. Right, okay. Um, it was quite a close run thing, but they were head and shoulders above everybody else. It's a bit of a sort of embarrassment of riches at the moment. It really it? is. Well Sadiq <laughs> Khan manages to make it on pretty much every week for one reason or another. Um, but at the moment actually I can exclusively reveal to you that so far from the five or five programs I think we've done the BBC is currently leading. Oh really? Because they've made so many kind of blunders. Uh, okay. You know they had the Ken Macquarie blunder, yeah. they had the schools um, you know working from home blunder where yeah. you know here's a hundred genders they're yeah, teaching yeah. seven-year-olds on the yeah. education program yeah. you go I mean I can't even think of five I'm sorry <laughs> you know what is, it, what is it two genders is that right yeah. it's two isn't it? I mean, how do you get to 100, is anybody's guess, you know? <laughs> and just, you know, they just keep screwing things up. The vicar of Dibley, you know, doing your Black oh, Lives Matter. Yeah, I mean, terrible. just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so they're kind of like, okay, right. So they're, actually, it doesn't have to just be a person, it can be a corporate. It can be an organisation. Okay. Well, funnily enough, Maya Tuzi, who you probably know, oh, yeah. came in to do it one time, and he actually nominated the entire Iranian government as a plank of the week which was brilliant you know because it's very versatile you can yeah. you know we had peter in it this week because they were you know the ones telling you that uh, you're not supposed to now use animals names to insult people so i can't call you a greedy pig because that oh. really harms animals okay. and you kind of go really yeah. right okay then do get the national trust on there will you they've been in it oh they have they were in it last year definitely for their sort of you know yeah um also, the Natural History Museum uh, for, you know, deciding that, that Darwin might have been a racist. Mm. I was like, well, it's bad news for the origin of the species then, isn't it? <laughs> you have to go and blow up the Galapagos <laughs> Islands, you know. I mean, where does it end? It won't end. I don't know. I think it's already <laughs> slightly ebbed, yeah. you know, from the madness of the summer when we were seeing, you know, basically Sadiq Khan encouraging mm. Black Lives Matter marches to go ahead while telling everybody else to stay at home. And a lot of companies starting to kind of pivot around the word diversity. Mm. And of course, the BBC mm. spending 100 million quid on it. Mm. Um, I get the sense that that's kind of taken a bit of a back step because an awful lot of the people promoting it weren't even black. Mm. I think it's an institutional thing, that's my fear. I mean, mm. I think that's, that's the problem. I mean, we, we had the thing with the BBC in the last side of the problems, and that was just the pressure of, of public pressure they backed off. Yes. But the impulse is really there. I and think. I think, again, a bit like the journalism conversation we were having, that, you know, you've got these kind of middle class, very well off people who are now running lots of things, who have been to good universities and good schools and. They're all, I mean, you see in the civil service, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that some of the problems that we're having currently with, with the sort of filling in the dots from Brexit is because there are people who don't want it to work. Oh, no course. question. Yes, no, I agree. I mean, people yeah. who demonise UKIP and Nigel Farage for what he did, 
and say, oh, well, you know, he's never really done much. And you go, well, he did manage to get us out of the European yeah, Union, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's quite a big thing. Yeah. Um, and all of these institutions, I mean, I found it rather ironic, which I suppose um, I would be accused of possibly being racist about, that the guy at the um, British Museum who was removing the bust of the man who founded the British Museum is from Dresden. Yeah, yeah. And you go, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, mind yeah, him being from yeah, Dresden, yeah. but it's kind of weird yes. that there's a German in charge of the British Museum telling us what history we should know about yeah. and what history we shouldn't know about. I think that's wrong. Coming right up to date, uh, Mike, the, we've had this thing over the past few days, this extraordinary to do with the EU on the vaccinations issue. Yeah. Is your sense of it that there are like remain, remainers around who genuinely are quite shocked, actually, and therefore are really thinking we back the wrong horse. I think I think that has happened. That's yeah. my feeling. I yeah. think so. I mean, it's a massive own goal, yeah. bigger than anybody could ever have imagined. Yeah. As I say, I mean, on the on the Friday night when it happened, and they started talking about putting a hard border into Northern, he's just kind of going, "What? Yeah. Have you, you know, if so, somebody hacked Ursula von der Leyen's, you know, coffee or yeah. something?" Um, and it, they they basically showed themselves to be everything that, that those of us who didn't like them very much as yeah. an organisation. Yeah had warned about. Yeah, yeah. They showed their teeth, they showed their fangs, they showed that they were not in any way collegiate. I mean, they threw Ireland under the bus, totally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they don't even like their own member states because they're all kicking off saying, I think there was a German newspaper who actually wrote an, an yes. editorial saying, well, now we can know why Brexit was such a good idea. Yes. And the French, funny enough, today I was just talking to someone about France where Marine Le Pen is now head of Macron in the latest polls. Yeah, I know, you know it's extraordinary. And it? if she does that and she wins, they're in big trouble mm. in the EU mm. because, I mean, that's the beginning of the end. Well, apparently she's toned down the anti-EU rhetoric for the time being. Right. Apparently. I mean, that's just obviously strategy. It, it does seem to be, you know, it, 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 maybe it's a, a drastic uh, comparison, but you know when a lot of Marxists and communists, when the tanks went in in Hungary, they, yeah. Or Czechoslovakia or Prague, they they sort of suddenly whoa, you know, and, and this was a, the scales fell from the yes. eyes. I th it feels a little bit. I like think so. That, actually. I think so because also, whatever you might think of Boris Johnson and, and the government, they've actually managed to do Brexit, mm. which they never would, were expected to do, and it's been okay, um, notwithstanding what's happening in Ireland, which can be fixed by the way tomorrow. Mm. Um, but the vaccine rollout here has been extraordinary. Mm -hmm. You know, anyone who thought that. Um, Britain couldn't really do much about this virus. I mean, Britain is practically leading the world, mm. not only in, f in, in, in producing a vaccine, but in actually getting so much of it. Mm. And I think it's been brilliant. And I think it's very difficult for anyone, even the James O'Briens of this world, to criticise them. Mm. Thank you very much indeed, Mike. For My pleasure. Th thank you for coming. Enjoyed it. Um, just in case there is anyone who doesn't know, when can people see and hear you on Talk Radio? Uh, every weekday, Monday to Friday, 10 o'clock in the morning. 10 o'clock in the morning. Until 1. Okay, and um, then and you, you're on live on YouTube during that time. Live on YouTube for the whole three hours, and also we have separated out certain clips and certain interviews that we do, um, and which we put up separately. Right. So if you go on our YouTube channel, you'll find loads of really good stuff to look at. Lovely, pleasure, Mike. Thanks Thank you very, very much, much indeed. Yeah, uh, that's it for this week. Uh, don't please forget to subscribe, won't you? I always say that, but please don't forget. Uh, and we shall see you next time. Thank you. Bye.